Um, so I, I'm Cedric, I'm French, but I'll be talking in English because I work with Dirk and um, uh, I also work uh, every day in English with my colleagues, which are, uh, who are in London, Sao Paulo, uh, and Melbourne in Australia. And what we're going to try to do here is to try to introduce School of Data to you by showing the challenges that we face and the needs that we try to serve. But first to um, understand a bit of the history of the project, uh, 2012, so before the, the international announcements about data literacy, uh, in 2012 the project was designed initially by these two people, Rufus Pollock from Open Knowledge International and Philip Schmidt, who was at the time part of P2P University. And the idea uh, at the time was to do something like a MOOC, uh, so a massive online open course with the idea that this uh, centralized content would uh, spread data literacy all over the world. Well, uh, quickly enough, we understood that it wouldn't work that way. And you have to understand um, the perspective of Open Knowledge International, which is the NGO hosting the Project School of Data. Open Knowledge International has been for more than 10 years working on open data issues all over the world, which includes countries uh, of low income and middle income, which means that if you're doing something in English only on the internet, there's a wide swath of the population that you're not gonna reach. So if you want to do something that has an impact beyond France, the UK, and the US, you have to go on the field. And you have to work with people who know the context on the field. And this is what we did with the transformation of School of Data, which became a project centered on doing hands-on workshop and um, and activities. Um, so a key, some key info uh, about School of Data today, so from this initial idea of making a, a MOOC, today we are um, a network in, uh, present in 34 countries with 13 members organization, 100 active individuals, including our fellows, including the members of our member organization, and also individuals that contribute as individual persons. Three programs that we run, the curriculum which, is, uh, which produces the content that you find on our website, schoolofdata.org, the fellowship, which, uh, so for, for French speakers, a fellow is not a concept that we really use, but it's sort of a collaborator, uh, someone who will do work in line with our goals, and we learn as much from them because they are selected for their expertise than they learn from us. And lastly, an innovation fund, which is for our members and to help sustain innovation within the network, but we'll talk about it a bit later. So what for? What's the point of School of Data? And I think that's the, better, the best way to introduce School of Data to someone who doesn't uh, know the project because we, there are several layers in our organization. Uh, you have the members, individual organization, you have the fellows, you have the coordination team. I mentioned four people. Uh, including me. You have a steering committee who is, uh, who is elected from our member organization. So what's the point of this organization? Um, so we have a set of problems that we've been working on and that defines how we work and why we are organized the way we are. So the people don't know how to work with data. So when I say people, of course, not everybody, but a lot more than you would expect. So let me give you an example from 2016, and this is Jimena Villagran from Guatemala, who is a 2016 School of Data Fellow. And in this image, she's working in a workshop, and she's using a, well, an interesting process where she used, she designed flashcards to teach uh, pivot tables on spreadsheet. And the audience here are journalists from all over Guatemala, even the most pre prestigious newsrooms. Uh, but those people have really a hard time understanding how best to use spreadsheets in their work. And this very basic level of knowledge of data tools and data uh, methods 
is found all over the world. We work with people with this very low level of knowledge in France, in the UK, in Zambia, in Philippines, all over the world. So this is really necessary uh, for us to work from the very base of data literacy. And this is very important. It, it has become very important for us to not only have these online courses that are available on our website, but to spend the time on the field and doing face-to-face -face trainings. And we've been doing a lot of them uh, for the past four years. Uh, three and uh, three and a half now, and this is really important. This is where we're having an impact. But uh, working with data, knowing how to work with a spreadsheet, knowing how to create a map, doesn't mean that you know how to run a data project. You have to have a methodology. You have to have a data mindset. And this is also something we're working on. And to, to um, give an example about this, I have something which is closer to my experience and which was a few days ago when I was in Paris in a workshop where uh, some uh, associations uh, like us, the, the, French, um, the French local group of School of Data, um, were working with uh, civil society organizations such as the Red Cross, uh, Oxfam, Transparency France, etc., to help them work on their data problem. And I specifically work with Oxfam, who, um, and the guys at Oxfam did a great lobbying work to um, make mandatory the publication by French banks of the money um, created by subsidiaries in tax havens, not only in tax havens, all around the world, but that includes tax havens. And they did a report on that, which was the first uh, European, if not worldwide, report on this kind of information. And there was a lot of very in interesting information in that. The problem was they took three months to this, this report even though the data was published uh, as simple tables in PDF by the banks. What they did, because they didn't know how to process this, this data, how to work with it, uh, was that they copied number by number from the table to a spreadsheet, and it took two months. In one day, we helped them understand the process to work with this, and in one day, we did the work of two months. The problem is, because they did this work last year, uh, and this year, 20 banks, and not only five, are publishing their data reports, uh, they decided to subcontract this work, which is problematic. And so this kind of situation is uh, a really good example of what you will find all around the world, even uh, inside most, the most prestigious NGOs. And we're not even talking about uh, grassroots NGOs and grassroots organizations where this problem is even more striking. So we have developed in School of Data some methodologies that help people go through the different steps required to process this kind of uh, projects. So we have the data pipeline here, define, find, get, verify, clean, analyze, present, uh, which allows people to understand uh, how to work through a data project from the smallest project to the most, uh, the most uh, ambitious project. So the data pipeline is, um, is used by 120 person of our members. And I say that because people beyond the School of Data Network who we, didn't, we don't know about and we learn sometimes that they actually use the data pipeline. And this is because it's a really useful tool and that it's quite easy to tweak. We don't expect everybody to use it as is. Depending on your context, you will add uh, a step about anonymizing data. You will have, add a loop in the middle because you have to go back and forth between different steps. You will add anything that makes sense in your context with your audience. And the other, the other tool, the other interesting tool is the data expedition, which is uh, designed around the data pipeline and which is a workshop. Uh, which generally last at minimum one afternoon, uh, four hours, uh, where people work in groups through the steps of the data pipeline on a data project. So 
this workshop, so the data expedition is four hours. A basic workshop about Excel will take one hour. If you want to prepare that, prepare that, you have one hour before, you have one hour after to document it. So that takes a lot of time, a lot of human resources. For a coordination team of four people, of course, that's not, that's not us who are going to do this work all over the world. So to scale this work, and we believe it's important to do it face to face, but how to scale it? We had to build and to sustain this network. And this is why we're working on, as a network. This is why we're not a monolithic NGO opening chapters slowly everywhere and doing the same thing everywhere. Because uh, the people that we're working with, that who are members of our network, are specialists of their own fields. They are specialists of their audience. They have a knowledge of their context and the challenges that they face. You will have people in the Philippines working with civil servants who do not have access to a computer, who do not know what is an email address, but who have to manage um, public resources because Every year, there are one or two typhoons in the Philippines, which causes problems with access to water and sanitation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In Zambia, you have people working on health issues. In Nigeria, you have people working on extractive data. In Bolivia, you have people working on gender data. It would not be possible for one organization to be a specialist in every, in every topic. And that's why working as a network is so important to us. Um, here, just to give an idea, these are the 13 members of the network. Um, so Macedonia, Turkey, Nigeria, Switzerland, South Africa, Latvia, Mexico, uh, Brazil, Germany, Greece, France, Spain, and Open Knowledge International as well, uh, who works closely with us, mostly on the specialties, which are open data, uh, open data trainings, and open data policy. The summer camp is a very important event. Uh, it happens actually not in summer. Uh, it was a, it, a legacy of the first summer camp, which was in summer during an open knowledge festival. Uh, but the summer camp is the kickstart of the fellowship and a great way for our network to meet up and to exchange ideas and to keep networking, to keep being engaged in the project. And the, the fellowship, which starts during the summer camp, is a, key, is a major program of School of Data, and it's a key program to spread data literacy and to create data leaders in countries where we do not have a formal presence. And the last problem I'd like to talk about before giving the microphone to Dirk is uh, about encouraging and sharing uh, encouraging sharing and innovation. Um, this is a key problem because um, sharing means documenting. Documenting is hard. Uh, everybody knows that. Uh, we've been talking about that yesterday. Um, you can't, writing a blog post is already hard and few people do it. But when we're talking about creating a lot of resources about a workshop to help people run the workshop, adapt it, you have a lot more to write. You have to be a lot more rigorous, and that's hard. And to do that, we have several ways. We have the summer camp. We have some templates to document project, to document workshop. And we have an innovation fund, uh, which is a yearly program where we distribute mini grants to individuals and organizations of our network. And the idea is to push forward innovative ideas that members came up with and to also help interesting projects being more documented and more rigorous so they can be adapted in other contexts. And this example is something that we built in France, which is the data viz card game. So you have at the left, on the left side, the very early prototype, which was done in two days, um, based on the data viz catalog.com. And uh, the, the idea was to use this uh, library of data visualization 
as a way to engage people on data visualization without the barrier of the computer and without the constraints of what's available in Excel or other existing easy to use visualization programs. That has been quite a success very early, but to go to the next phase where you would have something more professionally designed, where you have documentation about how to use it, uh, where you would have a website to distribute it, then the, there was a need for some uh, support and some funds, and this is something that we're working on, and the second version in, is on the left, but we're still working on new prototypes, and that was thanks to the innovation fund. So these are, this was a panorama of the problems that we're tackling now. And Dirk, uh, through his research, uh, looked at the problem we have yet to tackle, but we have to look forward to. Thank you, Cedric. So um, uh, one of the key things that the School of Data Network um, wanted to come to understand was how they themselves could uh, help to improve data literacy efforts. So uh, last year, um, the School of Data Network decided to undertake research to help them better understand how to improve their efforts. So I worked closely with uh, Marielle Garcia, who ac is one of the School of Data fellows, um, to explore this. Um, one of the key things that we wanted to look at was uh, the data literacy practices themselves, both inside and outside the network, to answer this question. Um, one of the interesting things that we found was that the School of Data curriculum uh, uh, has very much become a foundation for a lot of data literacy efforts, and not just within the School of Data Network, but also without, uh, outside of it. Um, and very much the uh, data pipeline, which Cedric has shown before, but you see there on the right of the screen, this is very, very widely used, and not just within the network, but outside of it, as a way for people to understand um, how to use data and how to, uh, to make it something worthwhile. Um, it is also um, uh, the basis for a lot of the train the trainer activities that um, uh, the School of Data Network goes through and also its local chapters. Um, but what's really key to the contribution of uh, data literacy uh, and improving it is actually this network that has grown up around these resources and has become a community of practice. Um, so it's about those materials, it's about the relationships and the dialogues and partnerships that the network has been able to enable. Things that uh, uh, in this area that um, is still important for us to explore um, is a, a, a deeper understanding of how the pedagogy works, how the curriculum works, and a much deeper looking at how adults learn and trying to mold um, the curriculum around that uh, in order to improve the data literacy uh, trainings. Um, but it's also really critical that we define uh, the methodologies that help people understand the application of data to their context. And of course, as I said, knowledge sharing being so important and the network being so, so important, we need to look at ways to improve knowledge sharing within the network. And that is doing things like more face-to-face -face intensive engagement like the summer camp, but also looking at developing programs and projects that allow network members to work side by side and then learn from each other. So another key question that we were asked to address is how do we measure the impact of data literacy uh, uh, efforts? Um, so one of the first things that we wanted to do um, was have this understanding of, of how the network excel itself defines data literacy. Now, the School of Data Network is a network of individuals working in over 30 countries on a wide range of social change and development issues. Um, and so what we found when we asked the question, 
what do you mean when you say data literacy? We got a huge, wide range of responses, and that was going from things like just being able to use a spreadsheet, or uh, knowing where to find the data, or um, using data to solve problems. So for us, uh, for Mariel and I, to really understand this question, we realized that we ourselves needed to come up with our own definition of what we were trying to talk about. And so what we were really aiming for in understanding data literacy is defining it as the ability to apply and use information to make change. Um, so what we found um, when, that the value of the School of Data Resources and their context, um, the School of Data Resources, where people really found value in using them, was less about using tools, but more about understanding their con context and the application of using the data to make that change. Um, so in that, uh, in order for us to start measuring impact, what we have to understand much more deeply is uh, what are the effective methodologies for social change? And in that, really critical for us to look at who is delivering that change. So is it people, is it activists? Is it advocates, journalists, CSOs, citizens? Is it SMEs or is it even the private sector? Um, in the global network that the School of Data is operating in, of course the answer to those questions are very, very localized. So, um, where we think we need to do more exploration in order to understand how we have impact um, is this question of what are methodologies for social change. Um, but we also think that it's really important that um, as data literacy practitioners, we have greater intentionality on what is the change that we are trying to make. So are we just a bunch of data geeks or are we actually members of communities that are trying to impact and make change? Um, and finally, the other thing that we need to do better in understanding is how do we drive institutional change? So how do we make uh, CSOs, governments, um, uh, uh, private sector businesses, all that, how, does, how do they become data, literate, data literate? Uh And then the final place that we looked um, was of course around sustainability. One of the things that um, the network really, really wants to understand is how can we be self-sustaining for the long term? So uh, uh, right now, most of the local chapters are NGOs. Um, and because they provide trainings, these can be productized and monetized, um, really wanting to explore what fee-for-service or moving towards a more fee-for-service model actually looks like and moving away from grants. Um, when we were exploring this more, some of the problems we found in that was um, as going for fee-for-service means that you are increasing your accountability from a few foundations to many, many clients, and you need to have a lot more sort of administrative processes and things like that in order to handle it. Um, but the other thing for, for a lot of the local chapters, their uh, client base is actually NSOs and CSOs. Um, and so there's a problem there in that those folks are already uh, resource strapped and often when they are looking to use data, um, they're, doing, they're wanting it to do, do something very quickly. So they're trying to, to get it used in a campaign um, uh, and they're, they're not wanting to have this be a longer process. So things have to be really quick. But then the other problem is, is that NGOs and CSOs are really used to paying for things very cheaply. And, and if you're using them as a fee-for-service monetary source, that means that it's really unsustainable because they're not willing, to, they're, it's not that they're not willing, they're not used to paying for, for full prices on these things. So one, one conclusion that we came to is just, it's really not an either or proposition for that. It's probably a combination of both. But uh, really importantly, um, in terms of the sustainability, we need to move more towards um, uh, looking for new partnerships um, with people. And, you know, this includes 
working with schools and universities, particularly those that have now identified that they need better uh, and more curriculum in order to get their students uh, to be data literate. Um, also civil society efforts and uh, huge swath of the civil society sector right now that is engaged in data is the transparency and accountability sector. Um, and one of the pieces with them is that they are trying to make data available to citizens. They're great at being able to engage with governments. Um, and that's where their strength is, actually engaging with, with citizens is less so. So there's a, a, a vacuum there that School of Data can fill in terms of um, helping to make that, a, that connection. The other thing too is development initiatives. So you know, the release of data really helps move, uh, helps develop a private sector. Um, and so looking at ways that we can be supporting that. And of course also further um, uh, inroads into the private sector, though obviously that is a rocky road. Um, but most importantly, uh, you, I think everyone in this room um, can contribute something to this dialogue about how do we achieve data literacy. And it's really important for you to know that School of Data is a resource for you all to use, but that also we would get a lot of benefit um, from all of you, the diverse range of people in this room being able to use it. And with that, I'll hand it over to Cedric to conclude. Yes, so um, as a conclusion, School of Data as an organization is a network, a network of organization and indi individuals working on spreading data literacy. As a member of the coordination team, my role is to design, maintain, um, and improve a platform for our members to use as a support for their work on the field. And this work, this field work is essential as in is central to our commitment to data literacy. We're not only uh, looking at it from a northern privileged perspective because we're working across context. We're not trying to use exactly the same tools and the same methodologies everywhere. We're really trying to create a contextualized um, work that has a contextualized impact. Of this impact, we have, uh, we have We've had 30 fellows over the years who are, even after the fellowship, still doing work with CSOs, civil society organization, infomediaries, journalists, uh, newsroom and such, and uh, civil servants on the ground, e even after the fellowship has ended. And we have organizations who were able to build projects um, like a school of data radio in Nigeria, like the DataVis card game here, and other projects that are pushing forwards um, the tools that we can use to spread data literacy, and that has been pushing forward how we can have more impact with the audience that we care about. Thank you.